Pokemon remakes have been a thing for a while now. First kicking off with Gen 3's rendition of Kanto in Fire Red and Leaf Green that debuted in 04. Since then, the Pokemon remakes have followed a familiar pattern. A new generation would come out, typically followed by a remake of an older generation that increments by one each time, with some exceptions being Gen 5 lacking a remake entirely, and Gen 7 randomly pumping out yet another Gen 1 remake because... That's right folks, longtime owner... Game Freak is opening on new... Gen 1 remake called... Let's go Pikachu and Eevee. What inspired you to build a second Gen 1 remake right next door to the original? Money! <laughs> Come Generation 8, we were thrown a curveball with Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Or BDSM. <coughs> uh, I mean BDSP for short. The first remake to not adopt the aesthetics of its parent generation on the same console. Its controversial art direction aside, the game was also heavily marketed and perceived to be a more faithful remake, whereas remakes of old in the past aimed to build upon the games they were based on. This carries with it many implications, some good, mostly bad, that we will explore in this review, so strap yourselves in as we dive back into Sinnoh. First, I want to start off by mentioning that Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl shipped truly unfinished, which I believe is the first for a Pokemon game ever. There is no beginning movie or screen at all, just a black background. The ending screen was also missing and it too was merely a black background with some text. Every single battle theme but one, the wild Pokemon encounter, was unfinished and was instead replaced with a bunch of ear grating placeholder songs that sounded worse than the originals. Yeah, it was genuinely painful listening to that for hours on end. There were various glitches and bugs all throughout, and that's ironically still the case even after multiple post-release patches, but we'll get to that later on. Now, I know there's a few keyboard warriors down below screaming, but there was an update that fixed the unfinished game, you're just nitpicking. While yes, it's true that update version 1.1.0 addressed most of the egregious and blatantly unfinished aspects like no beginning movie or the placeholder music, that is beside the point and doesn't change the fact that the game did indeed ship unfinished. There are some people out there who, for whatever reason, will not be able to update their game and their experience will most definitely suffer because of it. The aforementioned fact is indicative of a troubled development cycle. This is rather commonplace for almost every single Pokemon title due to rushing them out as soon as possible to maximize profits from selling tens of millions of copies while limiting resource expenditure to capitalize even further but it was never to the extent witnessed in BDSP. The remade music that was included in the unfinished game, as well as those added in the day one patch, are absolutely incredible and most definitely one of the best parts about the game for sure. Now, the word faithful is often thrown around a lot when discussing Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and it's usually used as an excuse to explain why the game is bad or is lacking in content that should be present by default all the while pretending that's somehow a good thing in the process. You know, because paying more for less makes total sense. It turns out that ignoring improvements and enhancements from the superior Gen 4 experience in Pokemon Platinum is a bad thing actually. For example, the entire plot of BDSP is a carbon copy of Diamond and Pearl, even down to the handful of cinematic cutscenes. They didn't even do a reinterpretation of what those scenes would look like with more powerful hardware, like what we saw with Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. The cutscenes look as if they were ripped directly off the DS cart. Those awesome platinum enhancements that transform the mediocre story into a more compelling and respectable narrative? Nowhere to be found. BDSP are blatant regressions in that regard, and this is unfortunately not the only instance. If you played Diamond and Pearl 15 years ago, then you will appreciate the nostalgia bait at first, but will most likely find yourself growing in disappointment at the lack of anything new or invigorating. And if you've never played the originals, then you're in store for a relatively bland, uninteresting, safe, run-of-the-mill Pokemon story. It starts off like all the rest, and the climax is over just as soon as it begins. The characters are one-dimensional and are little more than narrative tools used to drive the plot forward. There's very little, if any, tension or stakes, which is criminal, considering that you're dealing with powerful deities that control the very essence of time and space. 
The plot of the original games was never something to write home about to begin with, and if anything, it has aged like milk after all this time. This is especially true when releasing after more narratively ambitious and engaging Pokemon titles like Black and White or Sun and Moon. There's so much that could have been expanded upon in this game in brilliant ways, shining a new light on the region of Sinnoh. All we're left with is what could have been. BDSPR, more often than not, faithful for the sake of being faithful, even if it makes no sense or actually makes the games worse than one that came out prior almost two decades ago. There are good ways to be faithful and bad ways to be faithful. I'll give you a great example. The health bar UI has been carefully preserved from the originals. This is a neat little reference and while I prefer Platinum's UI because of Dark Mode Master Race, the Diamond and Pearl UI is serviceable. This is being faithful in a good way, no harm done. Now, Diamond and Pearl and Gen 4 overall are notorious for being very slow. One of the aspects of that slowness that is memed to hell and back is the glacier pace of the health bar depleting. In Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, they took into consideration the quality of the game weighing faithfulness and functionality, and came to the conclusion that omitting the slow ass health bars would be for the best to not compromise the pacing of the game, even if it failed to remain faithful. That would be kind of dumb regression to throw into the game for the sake of being faithful, right? But that is exactly what they do in other areas of the game. For instance, the Poketch in Diamond and Pearl had one button to scroll through the apps. This means if you clicked too fast and passed the app you were looking for, you needed to circle all the way back around until you got to the app you wanted. Not game breaking by any means, but extremely annoying with an easy fix that was later introduced in the superior version, Pokemon Platinum, which had two buttons allowing the player to scroll in either direction. This is an objectively superior design choice and there is literally no reason to regress to the defective Diamond and Pearl Poketch. So what did the developers ILCA and Mr. Masuda do? Well, they put back in the crappy defective Diamond and Pearl Poketch of course. Which is the equivalent of reintroducing the slow health bars. In one instance, they take into consideration the gameplay experience of their players, yet forego it in others. This causes the game to jump back and forth in terms of quality, making it very inconsistent as a result. I've referred to it as a mixed bag on many occasions because of this inconsistency. It's like this throughout the entire game. The super cool Team Galactic base that actually looked like a Team Galactic base in Platinum reverted back to a normal house interior indistinguishable from what your average NPC might call home. Creative and interesting gym puzzles? Nah, players prefer math instead. The sheer amount of regressions to problems solved more than a decade ago is dumbfounding, and there's no real reason or excuse for it. You can include all of Platinum's adjustments and still make a Diamond and Pearl remake, because of course you can. Heart Gold, Soul Silver are a clear testament to that. The only truly original piece of content you will find throughout the entirety of the main campaign is the biomes in the underground which are honestly pretty cool. They implement the wild area feature where you can see and interact with Pokemon in the overworld, something that is surprisingly absent everywhere but the underground. The rest of the underground is the same, like the fun little digging minigame, except for the secret bases which are now much worse due to all customization being removed in favor of Pokemon statues, and statues only, leaving your base feeling more like a cold, lifeless museum as opposed to a comfy, home away from home like in the originals. You win some, you lose some. A recurring theme throughout these games. The Pokemon contests, much like the underground secret bases, have been gutted and are nothing more than a hollow shell of its former self. A midi square is one of the only areas with innovation that doesn't end up making it worse than the originals in some way. You can walk around with your entire team of eligible Pokemon, a first for the franchise, and a nice touch. It would have been cool to eventually remove the restrictions of the square to walk around with any Pokemon you want, seeing as how you can already do that outside of the midi square anyways. Speaking of follow Pokemon, that is a new feature that wasn't present in Diamond, Pearl, or Platinum, and is greatly appreciated. Although it leaves a lot to be desired. The Pokemon that follow you in the overworld are comically small to an unbelievable degree, and some Pokemon's follow animations don't work at all, for whatever reason, so instead they awkwardly float or slide towards you. Something that was never an issue in Let's Go, or even the terribly implemented follow mechanic in Sword and Shield. You win some, you lose some. The Pokemon models clash in the overworld because, unlike the human characters, the Pokemon use their own battle models but are scaled down to match the chibi aesthetic. This is what makes some Pokemon, especially the larger ones, look completely out of place. 
A solid solution to this problem would have been to create chibi-like overworld models for the Pokemon, something akin to what you see in Pokemon Rumble. I personally find the Rumble models to be ugly as sin, but I would definitely prefer their abstracted approach over the shrink mods that they ended up going with. Pokeball seals were something on my wish list that make a return and are largely left intact, with certain stickers unfortunately removed for reasons. The battles look and play identical to Sword and Shield, including all of its flaws like sloppy animations, lack of animations, lack of proper scale, and overall just a slow, clunky mess that has been outdated for years now. This game, despite now being the third Pokemon title on the Switch, still uses the clustered and underwhelming battle system from X and Y on the 3DS. These games no longer have the restrictions of a 3DS, so it begs the question why they still play like they do. Let's Go at least attempted to properly portray the Pokemon, which is more than I can say about Sword and Shield or BDSP. The exploration aspect of BDSP is much more streamlined than most of Game Freak's recent 3D titles merely by virtue of being based on a game during a time where that aspect was worthy of consideration. In Game Freak's most recent titles, the player is tasked with exploring narrow, restrictive hallways and empty corridors. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are square for square the same as the original Diamond and Pearl, which means that you get to play a Pokemon game with actual, meaningful exploration again. HMs make a return and are executed in a way not seen in the mainline series before. The player can use an app on the Poketch to summon a wild Pokemon in the area to perform the desired hidden machine technique in the overworld. For some reason, the wild Pokemon summoned are always the same and only consist of Bidoof, Babero, or Staraptor. While I appreciate the meta HM slave nod, I feel it was a missed opportunity. There's so many different wild Pokemon that can use these moves, and they could have made it vary depending on the area the HM was used to make each area more distinct and unique from one another, but I digress. Difficulty, when it comes to Pokemon, has always been very contentious. Some people believe the game should be brain dead easy because kids are dumb and need their hands held at all times. Others recognize the rewarding nature of using your intellect to overcome challenges. BDSP give away two mythical Pokemon right after the first badge, which completely obliterates the balance of the game. Not that there was really any to begin with due to some very poor decisions that we'll get to. Pointing out this balance assassination on Twitter caused a huge meltdown and prompted Twitter's finest intellectuals to refute with high IQ takes like just box them bro, as if I never once considered that as a possibility. While yes, you can simply box the 600 base point Pokemon into the PC, that is beside the point and admits to the problem I was alluding to. It doesn't actually address the issue and instead sweeps it under the rug. If you need to box them, that begs the question why make them accessible to the player in the first place? There's a reason why, when you're playing a progression based game, the player isn't given access to overpowered and broken tools right out the gate. It's called game balance, and it's a fundamental aspect of game design, something Twitter intellectuals feel is undeserving of consideration. It would be like giving the player a Mewtwo after beating Brock in red, blue, and green. Mewtwo is, instead, reserved as a post-game reward to avoid compromising the game balance. Mew can be acquired around a similar time in those games, as pointed out by some, but only through unintentional glitches. The Mew and Jirachi gifted in BDSP are not unintentional and are granted to any player that talks to them with a save file of Sword and Shield or Let's Go respectively, an incredibly low bar for such powerful assets that can be obtained by complete accident. Other intellectuals pointed out the ability for players to gain access to these types of powerful Pokemon from Mystery Gift, but again, those are not intentional parts of the main campaign crafted by the developer. They're tertiary rewards outside the purview of the campaign that the player has to go out of their way to obtain, whereas players can very easily and accidentally acquire powerful Pokemon very early on in BDSP that were placed there intentionally, and have the ability to compromise the integrity of the entire campaign. An issue that is instantly solved by reserving these rewards for post-game, or at the very least, somewhere in the latter half of the story. This is symptomatic of a total lack of concern, care, or consideration for game balance, which is kind of important in JRPGs and any progression style game really. The reckless disregard of rudimentary game design doesn't end there. For the third time in a row, the experience share is once again forced onto the player with no option given to them to disable it if desired. The trainers and their Pokemon are, for the most part, faithful to Diamond and Pearl. The issue is that Diamond and Pearl never had an experience system like this. You instead were given an item that shared experience with one other member of your team, as opposed to the entire party. This means that experience share was not taken into account to have the surrounding game balanced around it. 
your Pokemon will become increasingly overleveled as a result, demolishing any semblance of rewarding or satisfying challenge. If you enjoy breezing through the campaign with little thought or effort, then you won't mind this in the slightest. This issue is greatly exacerbated by the happiness slash affection system, which is one of the worst, if not the worst aspect of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. I'll most likely make a separate video diving into the intricacies of this problem, but the main takeaway is that this mechanic essentially breaks the entire game. As your Pokemon's happiness increases, they evolve into increasingly aggressive game sharks that literally cheat. They're granted bonuses like increased critical hit ratio, the ability to survive a finishing blow, the ability to dodge 100% accurate attacks, etc. This is the equivalent of turning off your brain as it actively prevents you from engaging with the game's mechanics. These game-breaking bonuses are achieved by simply having your Pokemon in your party. As your Pokemon grow more attached to you, the more detached you become from the game. If you're someone who enjoys pressing buttons while watching things happen in front of you, then you won't mind this. But if you're someone, like myself, who actually likes playing the game and engaging with its mechanics, then you will be extremely disappointed and frustrated by this mechanic that is thrusted upon you with no option to disable it. Another adverse side effect of this mechanic are the extremely obnoxious and intrusive dialogue boxes that accompany them. This slows the already clunky and slow combat to a painful crawl as the game painstakingly points out how your Pokemon is feeling. If it was once in a while or the battles didn't run like a clogged drain pipe, then it may have been permissible, but it happens every battle for every little thing and it completely destroys what little of the lackluster pacing battles had to offer. Crafting a harrowing experience that is wholly unenjoyable for those with little patience for such unintuitive bloat. Don't get me wrong, I like the idea of being able to bond with your Pokemon, but the execution is beyond atrocious. It would be like if Call of Duty implemented a mechanic where it aims, shoots, and reloads the gun for the player, and all the player has to do is hold the W key. It defeats the entire purpose of playing the game at that point. A more subtle and satisfying implementation of this mechanic would be something simple like unlocking additional animations for your Bruh. Pokemon the more attached they become to you, which is something they actually managed to barely touch on in the 3DS titles but was inexplicably removed on the Switch. The endearing head-turning animations were replaced with whatever this is. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. Instead of telling me that my Pokemon cares about me, show it through their animations. This rewards the player for taking care of their Pokemon in a non-intrusive manner, all the while making the Pokemon more expressive in the process. A win-win. Some big-brained individuals would point out that there is technically a temporary solution around this awful mechanic which requires you to, quite literally, abuse your Pokemon to lower their affection towards you. This can be achieved by forcing your Pokemon to faint, or by giving them bitter herbal medicine, aka poison them. Due to these types of individuals being too busy smelling their own farts, they fail to realize that this just admits to the issue at hand, and are merely offering band-aid solutions that are, at best, temporary, and at worst, advocating for Pokemon abuse in a series where the main appeal is bonding with said Pokemon. If your solution to avoid something is to abuse your Pokemon in a game about forming bonds with Pokemon, then that, perhaps, suggests there's a serious problem that needs addressing. Other people will be quick to point out that this mechanic has been a thing since X and Y, so why is it an issue all of a sudden? The main difference being that it was optional. I repeat, optional in those games. Keyword being optional. Did I mention that it was optional? You could only require Game Shark mods by interacting enough times with the Ami minigame that the vast majority of players didn't engage with anyways. The second it was rendered mandatory through normal gameplay means is when you run into problems. I would also like to point out that these are instances of the game being selective and arbitrary when it comes to being faithful. The game does not, at all, play faithful to the originals. Once again contributing to the inconsistency of the game as a whole. It's very clear that little to no thought was put into properly balancing the campaign when designing it. BDSP postgame does include some of the hardest rematches in the series, ironically enough, with Cynthia's second rematch dethroning Red from Gold and Silver as the most powerful trainer of all time. But this is unfortunately undermined by the aforementioned affection system. BDSP also updated Pal Park into Ramenus Park, which is essentially the equivalent of the Hoopa Rings in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, or the Ultra Wormholes in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, where you can catch all of the legendaries. 
The catch in BDSP is that you can only catch legends up to Gen 4. All Pokemon past that point are unavailable due to Game Freak's controversial decision to never include every single species of Pokemon in a single game ever again. The Battle Frontier is, once again, nowhere to be found. Instead, we get a cookie cutter battle tower from Sword and Shield that is somehow worse than the one found in Diamond and Pearl due to multi battles being removed. The online is far less comprehensive than Sword and Shield, at least when it comes to battling. The entire competitive mode is missing, as well as multi battles, so all you're left with is standard single and double battles. The incredibly restrictive 20 minute battle timer makes its return yet again with no option to extend or remove it, basically invalidating 6v6 singles for online play again. One saving grace is that Dynamax isn't in the game, which is great for players like myself that didn't enjoy such an over-centralizing, broken mechanic. The verse recorder that was actually introduced in Generation 4 is, you guessed it, missing, forcing content creators to put in extra work to cut out all of the dead weight in battles, which there is a lot of, and any players that don't have the ability to record their gameplays, but wanted to watch over their battles to help themselves improve, are simply out of luck. I cannot believe such a useful feature that was present on both the DS and the 3DS is yet to make a single appearance on the Switch. You can play with friends in the underground, but they remove the fun underground traps that were used to troll your friends, definitely making things less enjoyable overall. Online contests are there, to my surprise, for those who care. No Battle Frontier and no multi battles, but hey, they made sure you could play their trivial, uninspired minigame. BDSP are some of the most buggy and glitchy Pokemon games in existence. Even after the many patches attempting to tie up the various exploits in the game, it's to no avail. These issues range from soft locks all the way up to crazy sequence breaks that boggle the mind. The silver lining is that speedrunning on the various versions is very entertaining, and some of the glitches can be quite useful and fun to do, like duplication glitches. At least they were able to faithfully recreate some of Diamond and Pearl's infamous glitches like being able to reach Shaman using out of bound exploits. My all time favorite thing about BDSP is that it was made in the Unity game engine, meaning that it's extremely easy for modders to go in and make changes to the games. There are already substantial attempts at incorporating platinum elements into the games that should have been there from the start. These mods will only get more sophisticated and significantly improve over time, and I will be there to cover them for you all. I absolutely love modding BDSP, and my experience with modded BDSP is far more positive than without, so definitely give it a try if you have the means to do so. I do plan on making a guide to help those who may be interested, so definitely stay tuned. The whole point of a remake is to be the definitive version of the game being remade, or at the very least be a new and interesting spin on it. BDSP fails to accomplish either of those two things. If we look at past remakes, it's clear to see where BDSP fails and why. Fire Red and Leaf Green are very similar to BDSP in that they're faithful to the originals and were always seen as the weakest Pokemon remakes because of that. Fire Red Leaf Green did receive a massive assortment of quality of life features introduced in the two generations succeeding Generation 1 that, by default, make Fire Red Leaf Green the definitive Gen 1 experience. BDSP made some adjustments as well, but not nearly to the same degree. There's not that much difference between BDSP and the originals compared to Fire Red Leaf Green and their Game Boy counterparts. Fire Red Leaf Green also expanded upon the base game by adding an entire new area called the Sevi Islands. BDSP's post game is, without a doubt, better than the bare bones offered in Diamond and Pearl, but that's not really saying much and it still pales greatly in comparison to Pokemon Platinum. Crystal was the first third version to introduce meaningful additions that differentiated it from the first two versions, with the introduction of Yuzine and his Suicune side quest, among other things. Harkold Soul Silver, a Generation 2 remake, did the obvious by including those Crystal additions, and established the gold standard for what makes a Pokemon remake great. It's still revered as one of the greatest Pokemon titles to exist, partly for that reason. Heart Gold Soul Silver was also filled to the brim with both old and new content alike. I could go on for hours about why Heart Gold Soul Silver are so great, but we'll leave it at that. BDSP, on the other hand, omits platinum content at almost every turn, actively making the games worse because of it. Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire took a different approach. It abandoned the gold standard established by Heart Gold Soul Silver by foregoing elements introduced in Pokemon Emerald, something many fans, including myself, are still very bitter over, to say the least. All in favor of coming up with entirely new content, which satisfies the new spin criteria mentioned earlier. BDSP, by comparison, tries its very best 
to avoid carving its own identity by offering new material. Even Let's Go, arguably the worst Pokemon remake of all time, at least tries something different to make a name for itself. All in all, most of the changes were awful, but they were changes nonetheless. Every past Pokemon remake at least attempts to warrant their existence, whereas BDSP does not. To conclude, BDSP's odd decision to create a faithful recreation of a relatively underwhelming Pokemon game from 15 years ago, while actively avoiding improvements from Platinum and reintroducing regressions to problems addressed long ago, doomed the games from the beginning. When you think Gen 4 Remake, a faithful recreation of the worst parts of Gen 4 is the last thing that comes to mind, if at all. That's because Diamond and Pearl are lackluster games, and it wasn't until Platinum that Gen 4 garnered the respect and success it has today. Gen 4 is my favorite generation, but BDSP utterly fails to capture what made Gen 4 so great. BDSP blurs the lines between a remake and a remaster and if anything serves more as a reboot, there is very little incentive to play this game when a superior version already exists. The exception being if you have access to mods, which enhance the experience greatly and actually makes it worthwhile to play. If you plan on playing this game online a bunch, then you unfortunately have no choice but to go out and get it. Otherwise, you're much better off playing Pokemon Platinum. If you hate yourself enough to want to play through this game without mods, then I suggest either borrowing it from a friend, renting it, if that's still even a thing, or sailing the high seas, if you know what I mean. Well, this marks my very last video of 2021. I wanted to thank you guys for watching and for a fun year. With Legends Arceus right around the corner, 2022 is already shaping up to be a good time. So definitely consider subscribing if you want to come along for the ride. Did you get BDSP or were you planning on it? If you did, did you like it? Feel free to leave your thoughts down below as I read every comment. I hope you all had a Merry Christmas and have a Happy New Year. I will see you all on the other side. Cheers.